The Qualis Center is a business unit of Winock International and the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for more sustainable and equitable food systems for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we are focused on advancing regional, collaborative efforts around the country to move good food healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into the larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the networks. Our goal uh, our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there is abundant supply of good food to meet the, meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can uh, learn more about the great work uh, of the National Good Food Network on our website, ngfn.org. We have a library of fantastic resources for scaling up good food. Especially of note is our section on food hubs. You can get there by typing foodhub.info into your web browser. We also archive all of our webinars there. Please feel free to contact us. We are contact at ngfn.org. So now let me introduce our moderator for this webinar, Dr. John Fisk, the director of the Wallace Center at Windrock International. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here and to have all of you on the call with us today. This particular webinar, I think, uh, comes at a, a wonderful time as we um, consider what to do in Washington with the Farm Bill and where to allocate resources, and hopefully we're building a case for uh, some solid approaches towards addressing food access. Uh, we've got three presenters, uh, four presenters today, including myself, actually, but we're going to start off uh, with Carl Sutton out of Montana and follow up uh, at the end of that with myself and then with Michelle Muldoon and Ashley Taylor from the Wallace Center. But let me introduce you to Carl right now, who will take us uh, through his slide deck and what he's doing out in Montana, and then we'll return back to me to talk a bit more about some of the, uh, some of the trends and issues. Carl's going to pre present a really nice example of what he's doing. Carl Sutton uh, currently serves as the program manager for the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Cooperative Development Center. He has a background in education, networking, and community-based participation research, as well as food systems development. He's the author of articles on food systems and education, and in his spare time, I find it hard to believe that Carl has a lot of spare time, but in his spare time, his wife and his daughter are revitalizing a small, diversified fruit and vegetable farm outside of Polson, Montana. Carl? Thank you, John. Yep. Um. Someone want to forward? You got you got the slide control. Yep. Okay. And still not in control of it though. There we go. So as John said, I'm I'm Carl Sutton. I'm the program manager of Mission Mountain Food Enterprise and Cooperative Development Center. Uh, we are part of Lake County Community Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit uh, economic development organization in uh, Lake County, Montana. Uh, Lake County is about an hour north of uh, our urban center, which is Missoula, Montana. Um, our, our role is, um, as an organization is to enhance the quality of life and economic well-being of all our residents in Lake County and the Flathead Indian Reservation. To do that, um, our center, um, our, our centers, our organization, we have we have three three divisions that deliver services to a broad a base of businesses. Uh, we have the business development center, which uh, manages revolving loan funds, um, also a, a rural micro enterprise um, a loan program, and they work primarily with uh, independent. Uh, non-food related businesses, although our, our center, our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center does uh, overlap with their clients. Uh, we also have a community services center 
which which works with um, managing um, larger um, uh, developments such as road projects, aquatic centers, um, uh, bike paths, some of the, the larger funding uh, funds that um, could not be managed individually by these small communities. And then we have the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center and Cooperative Development, which is what I'm part of. Uh, can you move me forward? So the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, uh, we have three program areas. Uh, within that, we have a, a USDA, um, FDA, and Montana Department of Agriculture Organic Program Inspected Food Processing Facility. Within this facility, we have a USDA meat room. Uh, we have a FDA inspected vegetable wash and processing area. We have a large production room that has steam jacketed kettles um, and um, smaller water jacketed kettles. We have uh, dry storage warehousing with forklifts, and we also have freezer and cooler space. And then also within uh, our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, we um, provide technical assistance to food entrepreneurs, um, including uh, regulatory expertise in um, hazard analysis, critical control points, uh, better process control school, and good agricultural practices. We also can deliver services in business planning, grant writing, and then um, accessing uh, capital. And then we also, myself um, and my colleague are cooperative development specialists that assist with project planning, group facilitation, operating and capitalization strategies, research, and board training. And then our, our final program area is the Farm to Institution Enterprise Development Program, which I'll talk in more detail during this presentation. So to give you a brief historical complex, or context of our um, Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, in 1998, uh, the Alternative Energies Resource Organization, known as Arrow here in Montana, had community listening sessions throughout the state. And in that listening session here in our region, uh, community members said that they wanted a place where they could uh, create new food products and to have a facility that was inspected, which would allow them to sell those products in retail markets. So in 1999, our center um, established the first cooperative business development center in the state. And then in 2000, um, between 1999 and 2000, uh, a feasibility analysis was conducted for our food processing facility. And then in 2000, the first phases of the facility were completed. In 2003, our cooperative development center um, helped establish the Western Montana Growers Cooperative, which I will which the West Montana Growers Cooperative is a co-op of 38 um, small acreage fruit, vegetable, um, and um, some beef and dairy producers in our region. And I will talk more detail in our roles with them uh, later in the presentation. By 2005, um, we were one of 10 federally funded food and ag innovation centers. And then by 2009, uh, our center, working with a network of partners around the state, uh, established the Montana Department of Agriculture Food and Agriculture Development Center Network, which this network was is, a, is made up of four sites uh, spread throughout the state that focus on value-added uh, farm-based enterprises, both in energy and in food. And the, the Food and Ag Development Center Network really came out of the Food and Ag Innovation Program. We took what was um, piloted during that 2005 grant period and made it a permanent uh, feature in our state. So here's a map of Montana. Uh, you can see with the star we're located in Rodan, Montana, which is a population of 1,871 people. 
And then the, the circle represents our uh, geographic area that our farm to institution program uh, primarily serves. Uh, but as uh, our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center really represents the western region of Montana, so we provide services to businesses throughout all these counties. Um, our service area is approximately 14,000 square miles, and you can see 278,000 people. So we are very large geography with a small population base. Uh, so our farm to institution program strives to improve efficiencies across the value chain through value-based relationships, increase the availability of Montana food, and in, implement innovative marketing strategies. Um, to do that, uh, we really have been looking at how we can leverage existing resources in our area. And we have uh, been able to successfully uh, galvanize a relationship with Western Montana Growers Co-op. And as I had said earlier, our Cooperative Development Center originally helped found Western Montana Growers Co-op, but they operate as their own um, not-for-profit cooperative marketing association. Uh, what we have done um, in looking at what resources to leverage, we really identified what strengths our center provides, which is skilled processors. Um, we're an inspected food processing and storage facility, and we have food safety expertise. But the areas that we lack, Western Montana Growers Co-op really um, fills in, which is the skilled production, the distribution with trucks, and marketing infrastructure, and then they really know their market in Montana. So in 2009, we began discussions of looking at how to um, create a broader funding portfolio for our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, and we really began to target a farm to institution program. Uh, in evaluating that, we, we really wanted to be able to remove some of our, um, we wanted to create a funding stream for our food processing infrastructure, including processors, but also upkeep. And grant funding really was not a stable funding stream for that. So what we did is we began to sit down with Western Montana Growers Co-op and the University of Montana, which has a very strong farm to college program and inventory what uh, production the Growers Co-op has and what needs um, the University of Montana has. And so in that development, um, our role primarily was as a, a food entrepreneur. We own the inventory. We identified the potential products that we developed in our food processing facility. We coordinated the producers that would distribute it to us we bought direct from those producers. We marketed the products not only through Western Montana Growers Co-op, but we identified other um, distributors within our region to work with. And also, at times, we drop shipped through UPS and also with couriers. So in, we were very much bootstrapping this, this operation. Um, we, in developing our process and efficiencies, we didn't necessarily have the equipment that was very efficient for processing a lot of our crops. So we, again, bootstrapped our processing uh, by um, any means necessary to peel squash and to blanch them, for example. Um, what happened as a result of this, we had higher unit prices, marginal distribution, cash flow issues as a nonprofit have been a glaring issue, um, uneven distribution of risk and limited growth potential. So uh, in 2011, we began to test a new, um, new strategy to approach our farm to institution program. And this actually happened as a result of a product that we were selling down to the University of Montana. We were um, grinding and processing beef crumbles for the university that are from Montana um, producers. The university actually said they wanted to have a grass-finished beef product 
across their dining services, and they were able to find a, a producer group to supply them with the beef. Um, but our pro but separate of that, our product, the beef crumbles, was not coming from that producer group. They wanted to work with another smaller producer in supplying that beef. So I, as coordinator of this project, um, I began to talk with this, this grass-fed beef producer and the university and put together some costs of the products. And what we were finding is when our organization would buy the beef, grind it, and own the product, um, the, the price point became completely um, unmanageable for the university. And so we, we took a different approach. The university actually bought whole live cows from the beef producer and then paid uh, a USDA slaughter facility to slaughter those beef cows and then paid our center to further process those cows into beef crumbles and then store them at our facility and distribute them down to the university. And as a result of this reorganization of the value chain, uh, the product cost less um, at the end for the University of Montana. And so we, we use this as a learning moment to begin looking at our role with Western Montana Growers Co-op and to uh, test a new market, which is the fresh fruit and vegetable snack program that um, in our area, we have very small school districts and, and we have a number of them that qualify for this program. And so uh, we were owning products, uh, season extended products, which are like our season extended products are um, frozen cherries, uh, frozen butternut squash, uh, frozen pumpkin puree. We were still, Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center was owning those products. But with the fresh fruit and vegetable snack program, West Montana Growers Co-op began owning those products. Um, and within that, we began to spread some of the risk across the value chains, and we began to find that um, some of our price points were actually getting closer and closer to um, what the schools could manage. Next. So in 2011, we also had the luxury of having uh, a Food Corps service member here at Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center. Uh, we had, um, it was called the Montana Rural Food Corps Program, which had not yet um, Montana had not yet joined the National Food Corps Program. Um, we were actually one of the original founders of the Food Corps model, and we continued that last year um, as our own entity in Montana. And so uh, we also had the luxury with this Food Corps service member that she had a background in marketing and also in um, um, culinary. And so she really was versed in working with schools but also at the same time very savvy, savvy in how to um, improve our, our market exposure with these products. Um, so in, she has since moved on to a full role with our organization as an employed staff. Um, and we have a National Food Corps service member here during 2012 and also a VISTA volunteer. And they both are... Um, that team is really working with Western Montana Growers Co-op on um, supplying the fresh fruit and vegetable and season extended products um, to our area school districts. And what we have done is we have adopted um, the, the cost sharing model that we had modeled in 2011. And so what I mean by that is we um, created some formal memorandum of understandings that define the formal relationship of Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center and Western Montana Growers Co-op. Our center, MMFEC, no longer owns the product. Western Montana Growers Co-op owns the product. Our center provides them assistance in getting um, a, an approved label for their product so that they can market, it, market them wholesale. As a result, also within this memorandum of understanding, we really wanted to tackle the cash flow issue that we kept finding um, as a nonprofit and trying to scale up product. We just didn't have the cash to pay out for 10,000 pounds of cherries, 10,000 pounds of squash. 
we really couldn't move forward with that. So in this mem memorandum of understanding, Western Montana Growers Co-op um, and our center have agreed to, um, to uh, not pay until a quarter of the inventory has been sold. So the growers within the co-op will not receive payment for their raw products, nor will our center receive payment for the processing costs until a quarter of the inventory is out of the freezer here or at Western Montana Growers Co-op Warehouse. Next. As a result of this relationship, we have freed up, um, we have streamlined this value chain. You can see by the numbers in 2011, we had 9,000 pounds processed for the year in the fresh fruit vegetable program, which was approximately a little over 21,000 snacks for students in the elementary school. By 2012, at this point, only three months into the season, we have over 10,000 pounds processed and approximately 24,000 snacks. And you'll also see in our season extended products, the frozen cherries, the frozen squash, uh, we last year had a little over 19,000 pounds processed, and to date we have about 18,000 pounds processed. Um, I want to note that some of our numbers have dropped this semester because we're not actually processing the, the beef crumble for the university this semester. So these are all fruits and vegetables coming from Western Montana Growers Co-op. So in addition to um, processing and getting Montana products in the schools, we've developed a promotional program in schools to educate students and staff and faculty about the, the benefits of um, fruits and vegetables. These posters were developed um, with support from a specialty crop grant. Uh, we've developed 12 fruit and vegetable posters, uh, cherries, um, squash, uh, melons, strawberries, uh, greens. Those posters each have uh, some geographic information, uh, nutritional information, um, and just fun facts. And then you'll see on here we have this lentil patty poster. Um, as part of that uh, specialty crop grant, we also developed a a lentil patty product that's made up of 98% Montana products um, that include lentils, eggs, uh, fruit, uh, vegetables. And this lentil patty product is unique in that our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center actually owns this product. It's the one product that we do own. And we're set to roll this out uh, rapidly this winter. Um, just to give you a sense of our funding strategies, about 19% of our entire center's funding is uh, due to revenue generated by our processing facility and storage infrastructure. So that includes this farmed institution, but also in clients that will come in and rent the facility to process their product. Um, we, we are hoping to be able to expand this number. Um, but what's important about it is that that 19% covers the maintenance costs of the facility. It also covers the employment of three processors in this facility. And then the other 81% is coming from grants that allow us to provide technical assistance and project development support. So we get funding through the Montana Department of Agriculture, Rural Cooperative Development, Specialty Crop. We are a recipient of the Farm to School program grant this year. And we also um, have an anonymous foundation. And then we have the Federal State Marketing Improvement Program. So to give you a sense of our next steps, um, we are right now finalizing a costing tool developed by the Montana Manufacturing Extension that will be, allow us to pinpoint the exact cost of processing within our facility. We're going to use this tool not only for costing the product um, that we're doing in partnership with Western Montana Growers Co-op, but we can also use this tool for our individual businesses that come in to make their products and allow them to really prepare for entering uh, the wholesale mar markets with their products. Uh, we are working with the Federal State Marketing Improvement Program to develop cooperative um, school purchasing agreements 
The one area that we're lacking in our farm to institution work is a firm commitment by our markets along the supply chain. And we want to bring those markets into a formal MOU, just like we have done with Western Montana Growers Co-op and ourselves. Uh, we're delivering a good agricultural practices and wholesale success training um, in partnership with familyfarm.org in 2013. Uh, we're also working, um, we've assisted Western Montana Growers Co-op with receiving funding through the Farmers Market Promotion Program to expand their multi-farm CSA, in particular in our region, um, to improve um, healthy food access to our, our consumers. And then we're going to launch, fully launch this lentil patty. And so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, John, um, uh, why don't you take us into um, the, the next section of the webinar? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And thanks, Carl. Uh, a lot of what you talked about there, I think, illustrates uh, what we're going to be talking about more broadly in the rest of the webinar. Let's see. I'm supposed to have control. And indeed, I do. OK, great. So we're going to go to the first slide. So um, my role here really is to give an overview um, of some of the research um, and the practices that we've been up to in the last three years, illustrated in part by what Carl was talking about. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and Ashley, who are going to talk a bit more in depth. Um, so I'm going to move kind of quickly uh, with my overview. But I did want to say that um, you know, the orientation and the focus of the webinar is really around the role of the market in addressing food access. Right? With budget cuts and with a mixed record of success by public subsidy programs, uh, our conclusion is that we need to be more innovative and find more sustainable solutions. So that in the end, for food-constrained communities, it's probably going to be a mixture of market-based and non-market-based uh, solutions. And sometimes combining them, I think, for some innovations that we haven't seen yet, that we need, and some that we've seen the, the seed of, but need to expand more in the future. So in this webinar, we'll be identifying some of those innovative business models for food access um, that can meet both business and social objectives generating revenues and jobs, enhancing rural economies, and providing opportunities for small and mid-sized farmers. We think that identifying these innovations and their essential, essential components will yield a collection of models that can support systems change when added together. So let me characterize what we see as the problem. Uh, I think most of you have a good sense of what it is, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But uh, food, food insecurity results not only in hunger, but in diet-related re disease. One in three kids are now considered overweight. And 16 million people have diabetes, both food-related and diet-related diseases. And the problem is especially acute in underserved communities and among vulnerable populations, including communities of color, children, seniors, and veterans. Uh, just to give you a sense of the size of this, 50 million Americans were food insecure, about 14.9% of the households. Uh, and again, uh, the emphasis or, the, or the, the larger part of the burden falls upon communities of color, rural households, and Hispanic households, as well as uh, Native American households. Uh, and you can see some of the stats there. So, you know, one might ask, how did this happen? When you look around us, there's an immense amount of abundance. Um, a very sophisticated food system, um, it seems a bit contradictory. You know, and I don't think we, you know, this isn't time for the full analysis of, of why, how this happened, but I think some of the key things to keep in mind is that the systems really become dominated by processed foods, right? And that the, and that the food sector has really become, again, uh, mostly a for-profit endeavor, right? And that's not to call that a bad thing, it just means we have to deal with it, we have to work with it. Uh, another, I think another uh, indicator, or, or not an indicator, but another factor, is that it's really become national and global in scale, with an immense amount of consolidation. Everything from production to processing to retail to restaurants. The distance 
you know, commonly held the distance between how the food is created and where it's created um, is very large between that and the consumer. And therefore, there's a, there's a massive disconnect, resulting in the symptoms and the outcomes that we're seeing. So one could say with respect to the impact on human health, the system can be considered broke, is broken and needs, is in need of fixing. To kind of spin it the other way, this, this image gives you a sense of the full system, all the different parts of what might be called the food system, everything from production to social aspects to economic aspects to political aspects. This is more the reality in which we live, and the solutions are going to need to fall out of this reality. And this webinar and the work that we've been doing at the Wallace Center, it's our attempt at, at working at um, integrating the various factors into the solutions for food access. So what are some of the components of what might be called a market-based approach to food access? Well, at the bottom line, it's needs-driven. It's needs-based. It's demand-driven. The consumer comes first. Right? Regardless of what we say, it's the, it's the consumer that makes the choice, whether it be a low-income consumer on a subsidies program or whether it be a high-income consumer, folks in between. Right? Uh, there's a focus on, on non-conventional social food enterprises in our work that are bringing businesses and products to scale, okay? But they're balancing the social outcomes with the enterprise, so it's social enterprise for long-term impact. Models that we are looking at are tailored to the location, both rural and urban, and then those urban and rural linkages are important. Building on existing assets, all communities have assets. And trying to, it's, too, it's oftentimes too expensive to try to come in and ignore existing assets. Solutions, especially in vulnerable communities, are going to have to build upon existing assets. And meeting people where they're at, understanding the current state and not trying to overlay some kind of a model that doesn't really fit the current reality for them. Uh, the work around, our work around food access, of course, is, is emphasis is on uh, underserved, limited resource communities because I think that's where the biggest need is. Um, Oftentimes, I think what we're seeing is that some of the solutions, they're not going to be just limited to the underserved community. And many times, the market-based approach needs to encompass both what might be considered a wealthier community and a less wealthy community in order to make the economics work. And, and of course, the emphasis on local and regional food systems. A lot of the uh, things we're going to talk about today uh, are really based upon and stem from and build upon a lot of the work that others are doing across the country, uh, including a lot of the partners that you see here that have been involved with our HUFED program, our Healthy uh, Urban Enterprise Development Center program, as well as the work of USDA, uh, work coming through the HFFI, from PolicyLink, Feeding America, and other organizations. The conclusions and the lessons that we're drawing, what, what I want to say is the confusions and lessons that we're drawing are really building upon a lot of what some other folks are doing too, and there's some, some unique contributions here. Here you can see uh, where the HUFED partners have been. For example, the one up in Montana, that's Carl's organization. And there's 29 others across the country that, that we've drawn uh, lessons from and models from and information from to present at this webinar today. So before I turn it over to Michelle and Ashley, let me just lay out what we consider our hypothesis in, in going forward. We've come to some some realization that we need to look beyond the physical components of access. We need to look beyond is what's the, for example, the distance to a store, right? We need to devise a solution that incorporates other factors. It's not just the physical components. There are social, there are cultural. There's all kinds of different things that need to make this more complicated, I think, partially represented by that earlier figure I showed you. Part of the, a big part of the solution is that we need to maximize the role of the market-based consumer driven approach if we're going to have a lasting and sustainable approach, right? But it needs to be done in a community-based way. We think that a market-based approach offers consumers uh, more opportunity for financial gain and more opportunities for jobs and more opportunities to access the type of food, the when, the how, the where, the quality, the quantities that they really desire. And that Conventional retail store, the presence of conventional retail stores is, is a good thing, 
but we think it's not enough. I think we need to embrace the alternative and more community-based retail and food purchasing enterprises as a necessary part of the solution. So with that, let me introduce uh, Michelle and Ashley who will take us through the rest of the webinar and then I'll be back with you uh, for the question and answer session. A lot of the, the questions that you're posting now, we will get to as many of those as we can after the webinar. So uh, Michelle Muldoon is a biracial and bicultural Asian American and is a program manager and food marketing specialist with more than 17 years of experience designing, improving, and running complex social change projects in some of the most impoverished parts of the world including Africa. Michelle created a self-sustaining business skills training center that still functions today in Togo, West Africa. And she was a marketing educator to U.S. family farmers working at Rodale Institute. She currently manage our, manages our Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center here at the Wallace Center. Uh, Ashley Taylor is a program coordinator with more than five years experience implementing and supporting domestic and international programs serve diverse, low-income, and underserved populations and increase access to healthy and sustainable food. She currently um, is the program coordinator for the HUFED program at the Wallace Center, and she supports the 30 grantees that I showed you in the slide set, uh, and is actively researching across best practices for food access, enterprise development, regional food systems, and food value chains. All right, Michelle. Thank you, John. So before I start, I think it's important to note that what we tried to do in this webinar is to distill about three years' worth of research, which as you can imagine is difficult to present in a 30-minute slideshow, which is our segment of the slideshow. Uh, what we tried to do also is to tailor this to the audience, and in our audience we have nonprofit organizations, academics, pr production, consultants, uh, funders as well. So we tried to prioritize according to the dominant audience types without also uh, neglecting the others. So to start, in our research we started first with identifying what the top five biggest barriers were and which ones you might be able to use to prioritize our research, our strategies, and determine where to invest our funds. So these are the top five barriers. There's cost and profitability on the supply side. We have price and affordability on the consumer side. Number two, infrastructure, whether that's physical, logistical process. Three, community engagement and buy-in. Four, consumer buy-in and relevance. And five, market readiness and access to TA. So depending on your business and your specific situation, these may not all apply. These may not all be barriers per se. And they're variable to change and your situation will change. So in the following slides, we'll discuss the key overarching takeaways from our research that cut across these five barriers and respond to each of them. So our top 10 takeaways include, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. It's more than just physical access, as John had mentioned. We need an assets-based approach. We need to know where we are in the business life cycle and the community development life cycle. And an innovative model is an integrated model. Do the research. Consumers come first. It's more than just fruits and vegetables. Marketing is more than just sales. And we really need to understand poverty and equity. So number one takeaway, it's not a one-size-fits-all model. There are macro-level generalities like, for example, economic data, like poverty data by zip code, percentage of the population on SNAP. There are micro-level nuances and distinctions such as marketing data and information, family food tradition, who buys the food and who cooks it. Rural and urban food access issues are very different. Business and community life cycle that you're in is very different. The business model. Are you for-profit, non-profit, subsidy, faith-based? What is your primary mission? And then we have multiple markets and multiple consumer types. Most of our partners do have multiple marketing channels where they're doing simultaneously farmers markets and farm to school and others. And of course, it is a very large country. We must consider our climate zones, geography, seasonalities, and such. Here's some examples, just a few sampling of the types of models that we're currently piloting in the uh, aforementioned uh, HUFED program. We are working with, and also with the National Good Food Network and other programs that we are currently running. Food hubs, 
there's farm to school, there's farms to institutions, there's mobile markets, regional retail stores and corner stores, healthy street carts, and subscription programs, which I'll talk a little bit more about in these, these slides. Now, the awards were selected, this is important to note, strategically, we selected 30 grants from among 500 applications, actually 1,000 if you total up the, the, uh, the total years. And what we specifically looked for to identify and pilot these innovations is looking at specific bottlenecks that if they were resolved would open up the flow of healthy food, so a high return on investment, alternative food marketing and distribution approaches to not compete side by side in a parallel food system, but to complement the existing food system and supply chain. Approaches that start with the consumer first, consumer centric, consumer behavior, meeting people where they are, and of course being market based, economically sustainable, and the bottom line of all is reaching, truly reaching underserved limited resource consumers. Number two, food access is about more than just access, and by this we mean more than just physical access. We often talk about proximity to a grocery store uh, and that sort of thing. Other considerations to include include price, convenience, selection, product type, a consumer's culture, tradition, habits, and background, what their values and attitudes are, what draws them to the healthy food, competing needs, for example, childcare, transportation needs, or competing um, competing businesses, his businesses that are competing for the share of the dollar of your customer, such as a McDonald's or a discount store or wherever they are currently um, purchasing food or meals. And most of these are variable and constantly fluctuating, so you really need to stay on top of it. So asparagus, what products are relevant? Asparagus or tomatillos, bok choy or wild rice? This I'll just go through really quickly. Um, there's many determinants and many sectors contribute to health and healthy eating and we're now starting to see much more emphasis on a multi-sector approach among funders and others and implementers. We're finding that that can be um, a better way to yield a higher return and leverage existing resources, which I'll talk more about later. So the CDC and others are talking about the determinants of health. As you can see, agriculture and food production is really just one small part of it and to not address these other complementary interdependent factors is really a recipe for disaster. Number three takeaway, as I just mentioned, improve your return on investment and sustainability with a community assets based approach. In an assets based approach, we look at the community, we look at the system at a local level and we try to determine all of the different kinds of assets that exist in place beyond just financial but natural assets, equipment, buildings, people, knowledge, health, all of these are different kinds of assets. So community-based systems and systems-oriented approaches as we've been mentioning throughout are better poised to address the complicated factors, these multiple determinants surrounding food access. So how we do this is we work with community leaders and our champions, and trust is paramount in all of these situations, and so we try to gain the community trust. There's a participatory community planning, so I call it you know, top down and bottom up, kind of simultaneously a meeting in the middle. We partner with non-traditional ag partners. Competition is seen as a positive thing because we are collaborating and we are leveraging each other's resources and as mentioned, the determinants of health and uh, working on existing infrastructure. As an example, again, the community assets, it's all about who you know. It's about trust. And in some communities they ha that have been historically excluded, <coughs> excluded or that have been heavily invested in by quote unquote outsiders, there may be a, um, a trust issue between investors or implementers and uh, people in the community themselves. And so our approach to gain the trust is to start first with who we know. And so step one, it's all about who you know and working with community leaders, bridge builders and champions and let those people help you segue into the community and help you build that trust that would take you a very long time to build on your own. And then learning about the community traditions and cultures. Traveling across 22 states in the last four years, I've been told time and time and time again, please just listen to us. 
we know what we're doing. So start with what people know, validate it, and build on that from there, and work on solutions together. So to look at bridge builders, I mean, just to describe what build, bridge builders versus champions, the way that we're describing them, we see bridge builders as people that are really good at navigating lots of different worlds, different audiences, and they translate between these worlds, and they make really good representatives. They can be national or regional or even local, and they'll tell you like it is if they trust you, and they tend to work at a, a regional, national level, as I mentioned, and they have a wide range of experiences, typically, and education, and they really get social change as it relates to more of a formalized, you know, system. And the bridge builders are really comfortable about talking about traditionally uncomfortable topics like race, equity, and culture, which we'll get into later in the presentation. Champions can also be bridge builders or community leaders. Um, but these are just your people that are advocates. They are people that really, you know, like what you're doing and they're there to help. And, you know, you really need to tap into these people and really cherish those relationships. Churches are a really good way to start with that. We've been asked several times, you know, how do we do this? You know, on the last webinar that we did last month, you know, it was, okay, well, how do you find bridge builders? How do you find champions if you don't know people out in that community? And so we started really from, you know, taking stock and assessing who we know within our current network and then, well, first of all, trying to figure out who are we trying to reach and then taking stock of who we know and then contacting those within our network who may know the kinds of people that we're trying to reach and then through word of mouth, networking and cold calls, introducing ourselves, you know, we started building this trust and this rapport and it has been growing since then. And traveling to on-site or meeting in person is absolutely vital in the beginning of the relationship. Once you are there in person and they know you are sincere, it becomes so much easier to do over the phone and via email, et cetera. So some quick examples around community assets, building on what is. Here's some infrastructure examples, shared kitchens. Here's some dual purposing examples. Um, well, some more examples, uh, leveraging resources that are already there and um, dual purposing and shared use of facilities and then pop-up uh, restaurants is an example and then a converted city bus is another example, mobile markets. And this one is particularly important because as we talk about cost and price and then also value, convenience, and location, we really need to meet people where they are. And so look for those untapped opportunities and specifically really get practical. You know, and in our travels we see in rural areas sometimes that going to church, you know, two or three times a week is a, is a social thing as well as a service thing and as well as a faith thing and it's a little bit of everything and so you know go where people are currently congregating so churches metro stops senior centers retirement homes barber shops parking lots um, after school programs playgrounds and that sort of thing and we have examples of all of these number four know where you are in the business and community development life cycle I mentioned this earlier and this is particularly important for those who are looking to invest or those who are deciding what's my strategic work plan and what am I going to be able to do in X amount of time. So you need to know where you're starting from, know your goals and your timeline, and then you need to balance that social and enterprise in the, in the social enterprise philosophy. And then identify those gaps and needs, get yourself up to speed, and then you can start moving further along. The one that's the biggest challenge is in terms of um, our experience and the experience of our partners is balancing the need for impacts with the need to create systems that create sustainable, true, and lasting change. So we need to figure out, do we need an immediate impact, a short-term, mid-term, or a long-term impact, and how long each of those is going to take? In this slide, which I'll touch on very quickly, um, this is sort of our, you know, life cycle approach to development and TA. As you can see, there's two things intersecting. There's community development and the business life cycle, and we must consider both of these. And at one end of it, we have a small number of mostly direct beneficiaries, and at the, the other end, as we scale up, we have a larger number of direct and indirect beneficiaries. And so the process is, you know, a group gets together, they're 
you know, upset about something, they want to make some kind of change, they organize. And then the next level is maybe they formalize and they form a nonprofit or they form a business. And then they become formalized and then they scale up. And so at each of these points, technical assistance is required. And there are different kinds of TA required at each of these different points. And it's really important to know that. So apply to a real example of one of our partners. You know, we have um, Centro de Librero Fortrizo um, in El Paso, Texas, and they are their their um, trajectory is you know starting small with just organizing. They were displaced garment factory workers organizing for gender rights and worker rights, and then they formalized and created a nonprofit that has many different social services. Then they created a marketplace. They were able to acquire a formant garment factory. And now they're a food hub and a marketplace and a museum and all kinds of other stuff. So they're scaled up at this point. Number five, as mentioned before, there's no one definitive perfect model, but an innovative model that can work with the food system and not work against it is an innovative model as an integrated model. So in the systems approach, working with the barriers that we mentioned earlier and wanting to ultimately reach limited resource underserved consumers and having social objectives, a traditional supply chain model may not work. We've got multiple markets and consumer segments multi which require multiple channels and differentiated, diversified you know, marketing strategies and supply chains. And then <clears throat> our business strategies should be differentiated and correspond to each of these segments. An integrated supply chain and marketing approach is necessary, and our goal really is to increase returns, minimize costs, and grow the high-value customers because it costs more to acquire a new customer than it does to retain one. And just remember, no company can be all things to all people, and so you must decide what's working for you and what's not. Um, a couple of examples, Wallace Center has, you know, if you go to ngfn.org and hufed.org, we have examples of other models that we've been working with. And so a couple that we're working on right now include values-based food supply chains with um, working with USDA and partners through the National Good Food Network, uh, which are strategic alliances between mid-sized farmers and ranchers and other supply chain partners that deal in significant volumes of high-quality, differentiated food products and they distribute the rewards equitably across the chain. And there's much more to that. We have more information in another area. Um, and the other is our work around the food hub work with USDA. So now, so now I'll turn it over to my colleague Ashley Taylor who will discuss the next few takeaways. Ashley. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, takeaway number six, do the research. As many of you know, starting a business or a new product line takes a lot of time and money. So doing the research and getting an objective, critical look at your proposed plan is important. And you may be surprised to discover that some assumptions you are making are not correct. It's better to find out early. Start by understanding, getting to know, and relating to your consumers. Understand how, they, how people live, the constraints they live with, how they shop, what they cook, and listen as you ask these questions. All of this is key information when deciding which products to market, which formats to use, what consumers to target, and what appropriate sale outlets to use. Also, it's always good to have a contingency plan. Market and consumer research examples include feasibility studies, which can help you collect much of the information you will need for a business plan. Several HUFED partners have completed feasibility studies, including Fair Food Market in Philadelphia and Eastern Market in Detroit. These studies took a critical and objective look at the market, setup needs, and related financial issues needed for their business planning and development. There are also ma mapping tools, some of which are listed here. I encourage you to check out their sites and learn how you can utilize these tools for your own community research. Tap into available resources like USDA's Economic Research Service that has fact sheets, reports, and maps for communities across the US with information on population, poverty, food security, education, and more. Conduct consumer research on your own, develop surveys, host focus groups, and talking circles. These can be conducted formally or informally. It's amazing how much you can learn just from people watching. Also, using market data is a good way to identify new strategies and leverage key consumer trends to remain competitive, especially with the mainstream food industry. Find out what is competing for your food dollars of your consumers. 
A good starting point is to understand your target consumers and what drives them or will motivate them to purchase and consume healthy food. Here are some example focus group questions, including do you typically eat a mid-morning or midday snack? Do you ever prepare dishes that can be served for more than one meal? What types of meat do you usually purchase, etc.? An example of a feasibility study was one completed by Detroit Black Community Food Security Network to determine the feasibility of operating a food cooperative in Detroit. They used a community survey, focus group series, and location analysis to determine if a food cooperative is feasible for the Detroit community and where the best location for the food co-op would be. One key piece of information that they found was an optimal location for a co-op is near a full-service grocery store because proximity to shopping centers allows people to do all their shopping at the same time, going to the co-op for smaller items and the larger traditional store for bulk items. So community surveying, GIS modeling, and taking into account consumer behavior modeling are successful strategies for finding the best place for long-term success of your food enterprise. Takeaway number seven, consumers come first. Markets are about people, consumers, involved in the exchange of goods and services and their decisions within a range of options afforded by their individual or household budget. Without consumers, you do not have a business. Thus, in our research, we have found that a consumer-driven approach that puts the consumer first is essential. Tailor your approach, product, and services to the consumer, making sure that they can relate to it on some level in terms of familiarity, recognition, and preference. Market segmentation is about understanding the needs of your consumers and how they decide between one offer and another. There are through your research to understand your consumers, you can split your consumers into different groups and identify vulnerable consumer segments, which allows for all of these opportunities, including product and price differentiation, tailored marketing, loyalty marketing, brand management, finding an untapped market segment, and reaching high poverty consumers. Understanding Different market segments in your community is also an opportunity to find market segments that may need or could use a product not currently available to them. Untapped markets are opportunities for promotion, for product innovation, and customization. Research your market segments and research your competition. What do people not already have and how can you change the platform and make your product different? And continue to learn about your consumers. This is a great example from one of our partners, the Samaritan Women. They include a consumption checklist in their community-supported agricultural boxes to learn what people are eating, what food products they enjoy best, how they are cooking the food, and what recipes they tried. Tracking eating habits and consumer needs is a way to continue to tailor to your consumers and keep them happy. Another way to keep consumers happy and engaged is to get consumer buy-in. I'm sure you've heard the stories about students throwing away their vegetables at school because they're not used to eating fruits and vegetables, they don't know what they are, and the tastes are unfamiliar. An innovative way to engage students and encourage them to eat healthy food products in school meals is a recipe contest in which the students are the decision makers. They get to vote on different recipes for seasonal vegetables, and their vote decides the winning recipe that is then repeated in school meals. Takeaway number eight. It's more than fruits and vegetables and from scratch cooking. For example, people also eat dairy, grains, and meat, and the proportions of what they eat varies from person to person and consumer segment to segment. People also eat snacks and frozen meals. Along with price, convenience is one of the most influential factors in food purchasing decisions. Healthy snacks, frozen foods, and meal solutions are ways to leverage key consumer trends and keep cash and time strapped consumers with a more convenient option. Studies show that in the last 30 years, Americans have gone con from consuming 3.8 snacks and meals per day to 4.9, a 29% increase. This is a huge opportunity for retailers. And according to frozen food giants, frozen is cheaper, healthier, and kinder to the planet. The frozen food industry makes billions every year and more during recessions. Meal solutions are competing with fast food, which is cheap, tasty, filling, and convenient. Meal solutions aim to make life easier, healthier, and happier for the consumer. They're family-friendly and ready for the table. Think one-stop shop. In all of these categories, there are opportunities for more variety of different product concepts, including healthier foods, meats, and dairy. 
The U.S. dairy industry has been collaborating with retailers to develop and install dairy meal solutions in grocery stores with much success. And there are also innovations in the processed meat sector to include better for you variants like turkey bacon, lower fat sausage, and grass beef fed beef. So it's a good idea to leverage on market trends and examine holes in the market to, ask, to assess how you might fill them. And back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Ashley. So to continue to the number nine takeaway, marketing is about more than just sales. The definition of marketing is the activity, set of institutions, and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large, according to the American Manage, uh, Marketing Association. Marketing is comprised of, or just to wrap up marketing, um, we call it the marketing mix, or the four Ps. These are the four aspects that you have to consider when creating your strategies. You need to look at the product, the place, the price, and the promotion. We did spend um, a webinar last month. The whole webinar was, was focused on food marketing and consumer behavior. We went into a lot of, lot of depth on that webinar, and so I'm really going to just go quickly over these. But just to give you two examples of each, um, and I include this here so that you can print it out later if you need it. Uh, product, for example, what does the customer want from the product? What size, color should it be? Price, what's the value of the product? Um, you know, is, is the customer price sensitive, which in our case is? Um, how is it going to compare with your competitors? Place, where do your buyers look for your product? You know, how do they shop? What's convenient for them? Promotion, where do you get your message across? You know, how you're going to reach your audience? And when is the best time and the place to promote? We, we do have that webinar archived. Um, so, ngfn.org slash webinar. Thanks, Steph. So an example for product, you know, product differentiation, um, differentiated relevant product, product that is relevant and meets people where they're at. Um, this was a nice little chart that was done uh, in a study uh, cited below. And, you know, if you look at where people are at now in their regular diet, for example, regular potato chips, the healthy alternative that you may be able to address would then be, you know, baked potato chips or sweet potato, baked sweet potatoes and so on and so forth. There's different products listed here. But it's just thinking out of the box on meeting people where they're at and then moving incrementally to get them toward healthier eating. Promotion, signage, educational material, informational signage, packaging can also be part of this relevance. You know, does it speak to me? Does this make sense to me? Does this look like something I'm interested in? Does it speak my language, whether it's, you know, your um, English language or otherwise? And then uh, community engagement. There is an example that you can find, well, we have a, a whole list of different resources from A to Z on the hufed.org website uh, with resources and tools. But one specific example is consumer guides on how to shop for healthy, affordable food on a budget, and there's much more on our site. I think one of the most underestimated um, strategies or things is, is what's your story? And I think that we too often underestimate this even in underserved limited income communities. If you can see, um, you know, our story adds value. And what is your story? Is it empowerment and self-determination? Is it a sense of place and roots? You know, what is that story that you want to convey? And people will actually pay for it. Branding, you can tap into existing movements and campaigns or create your own. And then promotion can also be, you know, very hands-on physical, like cooking demonstrations, handing out samples, you know, and teaching people about how they can use the products that you're selling. So the next slide is one of our biggest barriers in terms of infrastructure and costs, which we could probably do a whole webinar on this. Um, but just very briefly, just, just a few examples of how we would address the supply chain, or I'm sorry, the supply side of cost, income, profitability. So first, it's knowing that costs are not, that they're spread evenly, they're not spread evenly across the customer base because you have these different segments and differentiated products and all of these farm to schools can be different than, you know, farmer's markets, um, the cost of getting it to the customer. And think in terms of efficiencies gained are costs reduced. 
So invest in what's working. You know, you need to determine what's working first, and you can use tools like gap analysis or strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, there's also a Boston Consulting Group matrix, um, Cash Cow, and all of that you may have heard of. We have those resources available um, if, if you'd like, if you need them. And um, leveraging others' resources for mutual benefits, so the 2 plus 2 equals 5 concept, and really thinking return on investment, not just strict costs, you know, like accounting costs, but just what is the return. And also thinking out of the box on subsidies, and that's, those are some of the things we're looking at right now, is what are all the different kinds of subsidies that exist, including tax credits, rebates, free equipment, and that kind of thing. So a quick example is a corner store cooperative um, buying cooperative, which is collectively procuring product so that they can reduce the cost per unit of their product because their stores are small and they can't handle a lot of inventory and it costs a lot of money to purchase in small quantities. Other models that could use this are like our, our, our mobiles markets, farm stands, street carts, and smaller vendors. A way to address price on the consumer side, just some quick examples, is identifying the value proposition for each customer segment. And by value, we mean, you know, what are the benefits for all the sacrifices I have to make to get that product or service? And sacrifice can be a financial cost, it can be a time cost, it can be a, you know, a number of different kinds of sacrifices. Exploring subsidy programs, tax credits, you know, the EBT, the SNAP programs, and others, double up bucks we mentioned in our last webinar. And then quickly, there's hybrid pricing. You can do payment plans where people pay in installments. There's sliding scale. There's membership discounts. And then this concept of um, your anchor customer, and I, where you have 20% of your customer making up 80% of your profits. And so looking at who is the high value customer that can offset the risk of the lower um, income generating customers. Promotion, buy one, get one free, you know, just take a look at the, you know, the discount food stores. There's lots of ideas there and across um, food retail. Quantifying marketing costs and then reduce them. Um, reduce your acquisition costs, you know, one of the top things that you learn in marketing is that it costs three to nine times more to acquire a new customer, you know, turning them from prospect to actual somebody that's purchasing from you, than it does to retain them. And so identify your good customers and you keep them and you grow that customer base. So high value customers is really what you want. They will become your advocates, they will find more customers and the best of the best will give you new ideas and ways that you can improve your business and hopefully reducing your costs. So CSA Graduate Pricing System, this is one of our partners. I'll just go through these. Um, okay, next slide. This one I just want to emphasize a little bit. I know there's a lot to read on this slide, um, but the point I wanted to make here is we have, you know, according to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Wellbeing Index, the ten, the top eleven least obese U.S. cities and their corresponding annual costs, healthcare costs, and then the 10 most obese U.S. cities and their associated healthcare costs. And so it's really important to consider when we talk about cost and price, when we're educating people, when we're making the case for local regional food and what we're doing, that we talk about the other variable costs that are growing, such as fuel, water efficiency, and these healthcare costs. So the last takeaway, number 10, it's probably one of the most important ones, which we, um, but it's been mentioned throughout, and it must be mentioned that you know, primary bottom line, customer that we're trying to serve, the audience that we're trying to serve, the social change that we're trying to make is in the underserved, limited resource communities, and these communities have been historically excluded. They um, tend to be high poverty. They tend to have um, people tend to have a lack of education, um, and so you know, in our research, we found and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others have reported this, that poverty and education are really the top key factors that determine health outcomes. So you really have to understand where people are coming from and understand poverty and understand the day-to-day -day reality of people living in poverty. One of our staff attended a poverty simulation exercise, and we'd be happy to share with you um, the resources for that. We've been trying to collect more resources to better understand, you know, people living on $4.23 a day with food assistance, you know, what that, that is like and what they can purchase. There's a lot of research out there on that. And then equity, 
is not only about racial equity, and the flip side of that is disparities, but also we are looking and we're finding that there is equity and disparity issues around age, like seniors and not, um, gender, and then class, meaning your occupational level, and that sort of thing. So even within a race, you may have inequities around these other um, classifications. So really take the time to understand it. There's resources out there, and really let's move forward on this conversation. So in closing on the takeaways, I think these are just some definitions that we've been exploring. There's a lot of terms being thrown around out there, um, you know, around food equity, food sovereignty, food justice, and, you know, different people from various backgrounds are using different terms. So we're in the process right now of trying to aggregate this research and understand, you know, what, what is out there and kind of get a snapshot of what this is. But food justice is, is one example. Food sovereignty um, refers to the rights of people to define their own food, agriculture, livestock. You see this a lot in international, but you're starting to see it here, here as well, um, especially in Native American communities. And so in closing, our call to action um, first of all, it's to note that this research is continually evolving. We'll probably wake up tomorrow and something new is going to happen. There's going to be somebody new in this. Washington's going to announce something. Something's going to happen. So the research is continually evolving, and we are constantly building on it. And we welcome your ideas, and let's share those ideas and experiences and help each other and use each other as resources, and let's break down the silos. And regarding the equity and the poverty, really, let's move this conversation forward and let's get our local champions involved, those bridge builders that I mentioned earlier. I think the national um, programs really need to hear from these people. So there's a lot of need, a lot of great ideas, and not enough funding. The call to action being that, for example, through the HUFED program, we had 500 grant, uh, grant applications per year, and we knew we could only fund less than 20. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of need and there were a lot of great ideas and we had to really struggle to try to narrow that down. And then what you can help us with is because we're really trying to make sure that this is tailored to your needs is what topic areas that we have covered here would be of value to you for us to focus on in one entire webinar. So in conclusion, the key takeaways again, not a one size fits all model, it's more than just physical access. Looking at things from an assets-based approach, know where you are in the business and community development life cycle. An innovative model is an integrated model. Do the research. Consumers come first. It's more than fruits and vegetables. Marketing is more than just sales. And understanding poverty and equity is critical. So I'll open this up to questions and answers. And thank you very much for your time. Awesome, Michelle. Um, so we're going to actually put up a few polls. There are some fantastic questions, um, and we're going to we're going to get to them. But while we do that, I'm going to put up a few polls. Uh, in fact, I'm going to start uh, with this first one that Michelle mentioned. Um, what? Uh, how can we uh, best serve your needs in going into more depth? Um, so uh, feel feel free to. Uh, click on the uh, appropriate answer, any that apply, um, and John, take us through some of these fantastic questions. All right. While we're doing the poll, we'll do questions too. Uh, there's a question about, uh, I'm going to generalize it a little bit, there's a question about how nonprofits work with for-profits. Um, a lot of times nonprofits will get involved in the, in the food systems piece, but then they want to create relationships and partnerships with for-profits to make it happen, because a lot of times the nonprofits are not going to be the ones actually moving the food. But at the same time, if it's a, you know, if it's a public entity, or even if it's a sizable nonprofit, they don't want to show favoritism of one business over another business. So the question is really, how do you balance? Uh, what are the dynamics, and how do you balance these kind of things when for-profits, like many of us, try to get involved in really in the for-profit sector? Uh, Carl, you had any thoughts on that, or Michelle, or Ashley, you see anything from uh, the work you've been doing across the country? Well, this is Carl. I can speak from our our perspective. Um, I think our situation is a little unique in that one we're a cooperative development center, and that we were one of the um, original um, supporters of the the startup of Western Montana Growers Co-op. And really, we do, we see the Growers Co-op, it's evolved over time as its own entity, 
and we really see it as our local food hub. Um, and so for us, we, we really value that as a resource for moving products around. Now, there are other competing, competitive um, distributors around the state, but none in our backyard. So I think we prioritize our work with the Growers Co-op in one, because we're a cooperative development center, um, in part of our work, we really value that model. So it aligns very well with our, with our um, overall objectives of our organization. Michelle, anything to add? I guess not. Um, I think I, from from my part, I think I would add that um, uh, that not all businesses are going to be as interested in this in the participation in these social outcomes. So I would say, look for businesses that uh, are very sincere about it, and and even to the extent that they can make it part of their business case, I think they're a longer term and a stronger partner. Um, if you're fortunate enough to have a multitude of those. Um, then I think the only thing to do is to look for ways that all can benefit and um, and try to avoid competition and maybe promote cooperation along the supply chain. Let me, uh, I think Jeff's still running the polls. Let me find another question. Um, another question comes in around, uh, we started off early, Carl, you were talking a bit about balancing revenue generating income activities with grant, uh, grant revenue. And um, so the question is really around how do you balance that, and is there a is there a point at which you you're shooting for? Um, you know, are you looking for 100 percent revenue generating, or are you looking to hit maybe 40 percent? And if so, why? Uh, I mean, in an ideal world, um, well, we don't live in an ideal world. So um, you know, for us, for our farm to institution program, we really want to be able to fully staff that. Um, program coordinator position with the revenue that's being generated through our processing activities, um, and at the same time be able to fully staff our processors in the facility. If we can cover the cost of that facility and those um, staff people, we feel like we're we're meeting our objectives um, because our technical assistance um, revenue that comes from grants really is a, a support mechanism for some of the work there, but we also, you know, broaden our work to other business entities. Um, so, you know, 40 to 50 percent would be a great target for us. Right, and I think we see that across the country, too, because, um, you know, to the extent that a for-profit does participate, has an active role in the supply chain, I think there's revenue to be gained to help feed into other programs. But oftentimes the roles for nonprofits extend way beyond that. Or even, you know, not, maybe not just nonprofits per se, but community, other community forms, community based organizations. Education, uh, capacity building, technical assistance, these are the kind of things that don't normally get paid for in the marketplace and need to be compensated for in some other way. And so I think, you know, to the extent that nonprofits are participating in this kind of work, they would expect to have a split, a split funding plan, if you will, depending on uh, depending on opportunities, those proportions. All right, I know we've got another good question here. Um, another good question comes around the business model of co-ops, right? And so the, the, the person's asking around uh, other examples of cross-sector co-ops, where there might be um, either a mixed membership of producers uh, and consumers, or there might be a co-op that has both production um, and distribution and perhaps retail as part of this overall plan. I know for our part we're seeing uh, La Montanita out of New Mexico is a pretty good example uh, that has a distribution company connected to local growers, our food hub if you will, as well as several retail sites and, and they're fairly well integrated. Carl or uh, Michelle or Ashley, any further examples you might think of? No? Okay. Uh, but this is Carl. Uh, it, well, I know there's a multi-stakeholder co-op in Wisconsin, and I believe they're on the call today, um, if they're still on the call. Uh, but they were, they're made up uh, cross-sector um, value chain. 
and the Wisconsin um, Cooperative Development Center would have more detailed information on them. Okay. I can add something. Um, there's also the cooperative, the cooperative fund in, um, I believe it's in Vermont. Uh, we have um, the resources on that, and I'd be happy to follow up with you. Okay, we'll uh, we'll have Michelle get a look at the question uh, list and, and respond to that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about about job creation. Um, often a difficult thing to do both in urban and rural areas. What are, we, what are we seeing about job creation with respect to these enterprises that are addressing food access? Anybody? I can speak from our operations here. Um, since we, uh, when we originally reorganized in 2009 our Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, it was really, we had three, three staff. Um, and since that time, we've added three processors and a full-time program coordinator for the farm institution. So in three years, we've um, more than doubled our, our staff. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And how much of that actually depends on the revenue you're generating? Do you see a direct connection there? Three of our, three, our three processors are directly tied to the revenue generated mm -hmm. from it. Excellent. I would say across all of our heat fed grantees, we're seeing job creation and it's coming, you know, at the same time as these enterprises are able to scale up. That's when they hit that point is when more jobs um, are being introduced. Mm -hmm. Great. Here's another interesting question. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, it asks, have you come across any innovative prepay or membership models beyond the traditional CSA model that have helped overcome capital barriers to social enterprise development in the good food sector. So innovation around, you know, the, again, how do we upfront, how do we finance these things um, beyond traditional CSA approaches? Uh, the, the Madison, Madison, Wisconsin, the Madison Healthcare Co-op um, incorporates uh, a CSA cost share in uh, their wellness plan. Um, and then our, our growers co-op here is actually has worked with one of our local hospitals and their human resources to pilot such a cost share within their within their business. So you're seeing the institution pre uh, add some capital to these systems in order to uh, have positive health benefits on their employees. Is that how it goes? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, there's a lot of growth to be had there, I think, part of those wellness plans. Another way that the health sector is doing that is through, like, veggie prescription programs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those are, like, the community health centers, those kind of things? Yes. Well, it's also, like, instead of writing a prescription for a medication, they'd write a prescription for X amount of money to be spent at a farmer's market or um, a store for veggies and fruits. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, is there anything out of the Corbin Hills example that might address this question? Um, let me think about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Just to go back to jobs, John, um, mm -hmm. now that I've thought of something, um, you know, we had been discussing here as a staff talking about, you know, different jobs across the food sector, different food sector jobs across the supply chain and that, you know, I think it's just something for everyone to consider that, you know, what is your business model, what is your supply chain, what jobs within, you know, are you talking about? Are they highly skilled jobs? Are they jobs that require a lot of people and labor or is it something more specialized, you know, and so it's just to consider. Okay, great. And here's some poll results rolling in. Let's look for more questions here. I think we're pretty close on time. Jeff, do you wanna you wanna wrap us up? Yes. Yeah, sure. Ready? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really, some terrific questions and a. Uh, um, 
wonderful uh, attendance. And uh, of course, thank you to, to Carl and um, John and Michelle and Ashley and the whole HUFED team, including all of our grantees. I, I hope the ideas presented in this webinar have inspired you to new insights about your work. And thank you to all of you who uh, participated in our, our poll. This webinar is being recorded. It'll be archived on our site along with the 40 plus other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others who you think you'd like to have heard this panel and take some professional time yourself to dig through our excellent archives. That website again is ngfn.org slash webinars. This webinar will be up within a few business days. Our webinars are organized into topics, so if you look in the left-hand navigation area, dig into whatever is interesting to you. We offer our NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, noon 30 Pacific. Uh, Sign-up links are always at ngfn.org slash webinars. Uh, and we have some exciting pl webinars planned for the winter, so make sure you get onto the National Good Food Network mailing list so we can let you know about these learning opportunities. In this season of giving, I wanted to make you aware of a new opportunity. The NGF and webinar series has been running for over three years, presenting top quality learning opportunities for all members of the food value chain. We are now able to accept donations to help support future high quality presentations. Did you get some value out of this presentation? Do you think it was worth $25 or even 10 Would you like to support these learning opportunities for a student or a fledgling nonprofit? Larger donations support a whole community's education. Please visit our donation site, um, most easily accessible at bit.ly slash donate NGFN, and help support local good food efforts across the nation. I want to let you know about three other Wallace Center websites. Foodhub.info is a food hub, a hub of information research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration recently chose nine food hubs uh, across the country to work closely with to document their stories, read about our study hubs on our site. There are even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. If you are a TA provider or consultant on this call, you should take some time to create or update your profile on ngfn.org. This is becoming an established place for those in need of assistance to find their help, so you want to be listed there. Uh, hufed.org is our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center. We've talked about uh, that a lot today. Uh, as mentioned, this program and website is focused on increasing access to food to underserved communities using market-based solutions. On the site, you'll find a description of the initiative, grantees profiles and photos, and a library of some of the best food access resources. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know, hufed at winrock.org winrock or contact at ngfn.org. And foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive texts and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal status, such as an LLC or a C Corp. Visit foodshedguide.org for more. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is now also on Facebook. Come like us, search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in our post-webinar survey, and we'll sign you up. Please contact us at any time. Again, the email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time to get today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. It takes just a second. Uh, and thank you very much. This concludes the webinar. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.